introduce today's presenter, uh, Dr. Steve Polzine. He's the Director of Mobility Policy Research here at Cutter at the University of South Florida in Tampa. His research concentrates on travel behavior, public transportation, travel data analysis, and transportation decision making. Steve is also on the editorial boards of the journal Transportation and the Journal of Public Transportation and serves on several Transportation Research Board and American Public Transportation Association committees. He's currently co-chairman of the Na Transportation Research Board National Travel Data Committee, as well as teaching a variety of courses here at USF. He currently also serves on the Hillsborough Area Regional Transit Authority, or HART, um, Board of Directors, as well as the Hillsborough County MPO. His background includes working for transit agencies in Chicago, Cleveland, and Dallas before joining USF in their beginnings uh, 25 years ago. He is a civil engineer with a BS from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and a master's and PhD degrees from Northwestern University. And with North, I'll turn this over to Steve. Steve, all yours. Okay, thanks, Phil, and good afternoon, everybody, or morning for those out uh, out west. Um, the talk that I'm going to share today is based on some uh, work a couple months ago. I had the occasion to dust off some uh, older work we'd done here at the center looking at vehicle miles of travel trends and obvious implications to transportation. And in doing, uh, in, in looking at that recently, I, I'd updated some of my thinking, so I wanted to take a chance to share that with this audience as well. Um, and I'm going to talk both about uh, what's going on in the trends, but also what we do and don't know about it, uh, specifically what kind of data and information is available. Uh, when I talk about travel behavior, I often start with a with a kind of a basic introduction of travel behavior theory. Uh, and of course, if you scour the literature, there really isn't much of one in public or in transportation. Um, so I put together a very uh, simple two-page schematic here. Um, I, I'm of the feeling that a growth in income and knowledge. Uh, lead to growth in employment, consumption, social relationships, and time use. There's greater specialization in each of those uh, as income and knowledge grow. Uh, and those directly then uh, result in growth in person travel, uh, commerce, and, and retail activities, and of course communications. Um, and, and thinking about this framework, when you, when you think about the future of travel and travel demand going forward, um, this provides something of a, an anchor point for uh, some of that discussion. If you break it down into the kind of more classic categories that a lot of transportation planners think about, uh, we have this in the upper left-hand corner, a whole so host of socio-demographic characteristics uh, that we know influence travel. We've used those in modeling for decades. Uh, we're well aware of that. Um, we know all of those factors across the top, the basic context things, economy, security, technology, culture, et cetera. Uh, we know those feed in and influence travel. Uh, the bottom left, we know that land use patterns, and, and that's certainly something that's gotten a lot of attention over the last few decades. Um, we know that those relate to travel demand and the nature and modes, etc. Perhaps less discussed on the upper right-hand corner, uh, the business governance and institutional context. Um, the scale of business and government activities and their nature, um, I think a perhaps under under appreciated as the factors influencing travel demand. Um, all, of course, the supply and performance characteristics uh, uh, on the bottom, we know those influence travel as well. Um, and, and so this is a framework, and when we think about the future of travel, you can think about these characteristics and uh, in the context of what do we know about each of them, uh, how might they be changing going forward, uh, and what that might mean to the ultimate demand for travel that we're going to uh, going to see going forward. Um, the the interest in the demand for travel uh, in terms of, of some speculation of the future, in particular um, the fact that it may not be a linear relationship. Um, really, I credit Charles Lave with kind of first uh, at least putting pen to paper and uh, and talking through how things might change as a result of things like uh, saturation and vehicle ownership and, and labor force participation uh, of women in the workforce, for example. Um, he first started writing about that in the, in the 
1990s, early on. He was about uh, 10 or 15 years premature in terms of when he thought trends would change. Um, Subsequent to that, there was a fair amount of work on longer-term travel uh, demand, but most of that actually originated in environmental um, and energy offices, perhaps even more so than, uh, than in the transportation area. Um, in the 2000s, there was a fair amount of discussion and appreciation uh, and interest in, in understanding longer-term uh, travel demand issues. Um, I did some work in 06 for USDOT looking at some of the sociodemographic trends. A number of others looked at technology and other aspects, pricing, uh, energy availability, et cetera, and how those might uh, reflect uh, in the future. Um, there has been recognition of that, including in the last reauthorization cycle, one of the uh, study commissions was aware of uh, and included some uh, new thinking in terms of the future of travel travel demand going forward. Uh, other folks in the research community have uh, similarly um, become engaged in looking at uh, what might happen to travel demand going forward. Uh, and literally in the past few years, we've seen just a plethora of interest across uh, a number of disciplines. Um, and it's really entered the, the public media uh, in, in, in strong uh, representation. We see an awful lot of attention, um, some of it really Related to social demographic changes, obviously the economy, uh, culture. Uh, we see talk about both VMT and, but also car ownership and licensure levels. Uh, and there's been a very steady stream of, uh, of of attention to those in both the research and contemporary media uh, venues. When you look at the actual data, um, the left-hand side of this graphic is, is count data. Uh, this is USDOT data. Uh, the top line, the blue line, is the total overall VMT, all purposes, all vehicle types, uh, roadway VMT. Uh, you can see that peaked in 2007. Um, slightly below that in the red line is VMT per capita. Um, and that peaked in about 2004. Um, and there's a couple interesting aspects of that. One is that um, this was pre-recession, um, and the per capita peak uh, hit us before the, um, the total peak in VMT. Um, so there's something more than just the economy going on here, uh, and that certainly gave a, an, an early hint that um, the future may not replicate the past in terms of the, uh, the relatively linear your upward slope of, of VMT trends over time. Uh, on the right-hand side, we have a different kind of data. This is survey data um, based on NHTS individual samples of, uh, of households. Um, and you can see there, obviously, we don't have the continuous data. Uh, we're, we're subject to the relatively limited sample frequency of that survey. Um, but on the top graph, you can see this is measures of trips. Um, trips peaked. Uh, person trips peaked in about 95. Uh, vehicle trips peaked in 2001, according to that data. Uh, and if you look at the graph on the bottom right-hand side, uh, and you, you look at those measures in terms of miles, again, we can see miles peaked in 95. Uh, BMT peaked uh, in 2001, so uh, a slightly mixed picture, recognizing different basis of measurement uh, and both fairly aggregate comprehensive uh, measures. I've looked at some of the Florida data, uh, Florida data as well. Obviously, individual states each have their own economy and demographic conditions, um, but you can see here relatively similar trends. They're not going to um, exactly mirror the national trend, and you wouldn't expect them to as growth, population growth rates and other things uh, come into play uh, in influencing individual state data. The implications of this slowing are fairly significant. And if you look at the graph in the upper left-hand side, um, if one were to extrapolate the 1990 to 2000 rate of growth in VMT um, up to the present time frame, um, you'd see we'd have about 25% more VMT than we're actually seeing uh, today measured in the field. Um, 
that's a, a obviously a very huge difference. Um, but remember, back in the, that time frame in the mid 90s, et cetera, uh, a lot of the gloom and doom predictions of gridlock, et cetera, were premised on relatively straight line forecasts of growth in demand. Um, and uh, had those, in fact, uh, been borne out, we would uh, uh, have an absolutely miserable situation in terms of roadway congestion, et cetera. Um, on the bottom right-hand corner, um, uh, there's a couple lines on that graph. The top line is lane miles, and lane miles is perhaps crude, but at least an indicator uh, of transportation system, roadway system capacity, surface system uh, capacity, uh, and then vehicle miles uh, of travel below that. Uh, that red dashed line is about the point where the upward slope on the green line, meaning lane miles, uh, is, is more positive than the slope of the blue line, uh, meaning supply is growing faster than demand uh, in a crude sense. And uh, obviously, if you look at the congestion indicators of folks like TTI and others, um, you'll see that uh, they were recognizing, in fact, congestion levels uh, were dropping, uh, were reversing the historic upward march um, and reflecting the fact that demand has softened and we have continued uh, to provide new capacity uh, with expansion of lane miles of facilities. Um, this is similar uh, data for Florida, uh, obviously a little bit different. Again, you can see in the upper left-hand side there, uh, Florida had a huge kind of pulse of growth in the uh, in the mid-2000s. There was a lot of hurricane recovery activity as well as a, a very dramatic building boom um, that was pushing up uh, uh, travel demand significantly, um, and you can see there the deficit as well. Um, similarly, if you look at the bottom right-hand side, you, you have a fairly similar situation where in about the mid-2000, 2004, 2005 time frame, uh, the lane mile slope uh, uh, was more positive than the VMT slope, um, and things, in fact, uh, have shown improvement uh, as a result of that. So obviously, understanding VMT growth is, is certainly significant and important in terms of demand, um, but obviously a lot of other folks follow it for, uh, you know, climate, energy, et cetera, uh, other considerations that go into uh, um, understanding and, and, and evaluating the impacts of future travel demand. Uh, this particular graphic is one that I've taken from the Com Commuting in America brief series. Uh, these will be published shortly. Uh, myself and Alan Pisarski are authoring the 2013 Commuting in America uh, report series for AASHTO. Um, but I think the, 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 the important part of this particular graphic, if you look at the upper section of the uh, table, you'll notice on the right-hand side that household travel uh, constitutes about 76% of total travel, um, and meaning non-household travel uh, constitutes 24%. And if you look at the lower levels, you see uh, public vehicle travel um, and utility and service vehicle travel and freight and goods movement uh, constitute the remainder. Uh, so when we think about total demand for uh, roadway capacity, it's important to keep in context that person demand is only about three quarters of the total demand, um, and, and we happen to know quite a bit about that. That's gotten the most attention in the, uh, in the planning and modeling profession over the past several decades. Uh, we've certainly found a new interest in freight uh, demand over the past decade or so. Uh, we're, we're not as well positioned in terms of our understanding of public vehicle travel uh, and utility and service travel. Um, but it's important when you look at various statistics, et cetera, um, that you understand kind of what's in the numerator and what's in the denominator uh, and what shares of travels and behaviors are we looking at uh, when we comment about DMT changes. Um, this is a graph that just simply paints the picture that uh, changes across geography are, are different. Um, in sometimes in, in understandable ways, you can certainly see areas that got hit the most uh, severely with the, with the economy, et cetera. Uh, you can see that North Dakota up there with all of the drilling and economic activity with, uh, with oil fracking, et cetera. Um, and you can see, again, a, a, a variety.
variety of conditions uh, based on uh, economic uh, as well as social demographic trends, um, but some you know meaningful differences across the state. So um, what what works nationally may or may not be uh, relevant across the full country. Uh, this sets up a, a little discussion I'm going to move into in the next couple slides here um, that looks at at travel demand from a, both an urban-rural uh, trade-off and a heavy vehicle, light vehicle trade-off. And if you look at the aggregate data uh, like this, the trends don't look particularly pronounced, but when you start looking at the marginals uh, of some of those trends, you begin to see some fairly significant uh, changes of, of what's going on. Um, this is the Florida data, um, and there you can see, and, and it's perhaps more pronounced in Florida than nationally, uh, truck VMT uh, plummeted much more significantly than light vehicle VMT, uh, and again, that was uh, tending to be the wrap-up of an awful lot of construction activity um, that, that generated a lot of freight and truck travel. Uh, when that came to an end, and the, uh, it, it really dramatically impacted uh, road Way, uh, VMT. Uh, and, and keep in mind that these non personal vehicle numbers, um, while they're only counted as vehicle miles in the totals, in terms of, of their significance on congestion, uh, where a truck might be the equivalent of three or four or five or more cars in a traffic stream, um, or their impact on infrastructure or energy or environment, um, they're very significant factors. So understanding uh, what's going on with, with uh, particularly freight and, and heavy vehicle uh, travel is certainly very important, uh, uh, more, more, more important than their share of VMT in terms of the uh, impactfulness of travel. Uh, if you look at urban versus rural trends, it's actually quite telling. Um, the big drop, the, the, about two-thirds of the share um, of the decline in VMT is attributable to declines in rural VMT. Um, rural accounts for 2.9 percent of the 4.2 percent of decline in VMT between 2007 and 2011. And if you, if you hear various uh, uh, percent changes in, in, in VMT data, I would caution folks to be uh, very careful about, you know, comparing reference years and and numerators and denominators and, and whether it's total VMT or urban or rural or person or truck, et cetera. Um, and so, so keep that in mind as we talk through some of these numbers here. Um, heavy vehicle VMT accounts for about 30% of the rural VMT decline. Um, and rural trips, obviously, longer uh, in distance. Um, it's an area where you would have expected some reductions with a tough economy and high fuel prices. Um, if you forego a long-distance trip, obviously, the opportunity for savings is, is more substantial than uh, foregoing a two- or three-mile urban trip to, to a grocery store, for example. Um, and, and because urban or because rural VMT dropped, that doesn't mean it's exclusively the province of, of rural residents. Obviously, urban residents, uh, some of which have long-distance commutes, others of which have social recreation trips, um, they accumulate a fair amount of mileage uh, on rural roads as well. Um, so people need to keep that in mind uh, when they look at urban-rural splits. Um, as of 2011, about 67% of EMT was urban, uh, and the urban share has grown uh, a full percent just since 2007. Um, and again, it accounts for a relatively uh, modest share of the total decline in VMT. Um, and heavy vehicle VMT explains a huge share of the decline of urban VMT. Um, light vehicle only accounts for about 8% of the total VMT declines uh, from 2007 to 2011. And uh, again, this is one of those areas where um, when you see some headlines and some other things, you think that, um, you know, it's, it's changes in personal travel behavior of millennials, for example, that explain everything. And uh, it's really important to kind of dig in and, and, and diagnose this a little bit more carefully. Another area where people often turn to to try and understand what's going on is to, to see uh, what's happening in the way of mode shifts and as, as an explanatory uh, factor for VMT. Um, 
And a number of folks, including myself, have looked at the role that mode shifts play. Um, if you and analyze the change in transit use, and transit use has been increasing over the past decade or so. Um, it explains about 5.6% of urban light vehicle declines in, in VMT. Um, if you use a bigger denominator, meaning you use total VMT and all types of vehicle VMT, um, that percent obviously uh, declines significantly. Um, or if you use a slightly different time reference period, et cetera, um, there are estimates out there of 1 and 2 and 3 percent shares of, of the VMT decline attributable to transit, and those are, you know, mathematically correct in the context of the, uh, of the data and the reference periods and the numerous and denominators that they used. Um, but the message here is that it's a relatively modest explanatory factor uh, in terms of understanding uh, declines in VMT. Um, interesting, carpooling continued to decline, um, at least for commuting, um, but overall occupancy uh, of autos increased between 2001 and 2009, about 2 percent, um, from about 1.64 to 1.67, I believe, um, a, a, minus, a minor, but, uh, but nonetheless an increase in auto occupancy uh, on the best available data. Um, Bike and walk constitute less than 1% of total travel, um, and hence it's, it's, you know, given the quality of the data we have, uh, it's not realistic to attribute them uh, as, as explanatory factors in terms of changing PMT. They simply are not of a magnitude uh, large enough to, to begin to explain things, uh, certainly not at the aggregate level. Perhaps in some urban environments uh, they can. Um, and, and arguably, uh, both transit and bike and walk, to the extent that changes in behavior uh, can also influence trip length, um, et cetera, there, there's perhaps a, a, a more to it than just a kind of a mile-to-mile -mile comparison. Um, but if you do those comparisons, the numbers are uh, not particularly powerful. Um, domestic airline travel declined about a tenth of a percent. Um, so that can't explain the, uh, the decline in, in particularly the rural uh, long-distance travel reductions in VMT. And both Amtrak and intercity bus uh, are an order of magnitude too small, uh, with Amtrak being uh, dramatically smaller than inner city bus. Um, but again, they're just simply not of a size that uh, are helpful to us in terms of uh, explaining changes in VMT. Amtrak has shown positive ridership growth uh, in recent years, and inner city bus, while it's private sector data and the numbers aren't as available, uh, it appears to be strong with some of the new entries, et cetera. Um, but again, they just don't, they're not of a magnitude to register in terms of uh, explaining VMT changes over time. Um, the majority of urban per capita travel reductions are from trip rate and trip length changes. Uh, here we are constrained to NHTS data at the national level um, where we've seen a, a trip rate decline of 4.4 percent uh, between 2001 and 2009 uh, and at trip length decline in that time period of 6.2 percent. Um, some interesting things where there's a little bit more action taking place. Uh, the work at home commute increased from 3.26 percent in 2000 to uh, 4.33 percent uh, in 2011. Um, so that, that's one of the more dynamic areas of, of travel behavior change. Um, this is a graph that I've used for a number of years that looks at the uh, change in travel by age cohort uh, between the 2001 and 2009 NHTS. You'll notice it's labeled 2008 there. Um, about uh, three quarters of the data year was actually 2008, uh, so some of my work I've labeled it as such um, in terms of understanding trends. Uh, and if you look at this, uh, the area that's gotten an awful lot of attention uh, over the past several years has been uh, these rather dramatic reductions in uh, travel uh, levels by um, young adults. Uh, the, the 16 to or 20 to 40 year age, old age group uh, has seen meaningful declines in travel. Um, a little bit in the in the peak 
travel years, but certainly not to the to the same extent. Uh, and then, interestingly, the older age population segments uh, have been appear to be much more oblivious to uh, the economic and other conditions that appear to be influencing uh, travel demand. Uh, again, we're constrained here. We don't have a, a newer data point. Uh, hopefully, we'll have one in a couple of years with the next NHTS, but uh, at the national level, we don't have uh, more recent data. Uh, I stole a graph out of a recent paper by uh, Del Bosi and Curry uh, that was a national or an international survey of uh, licensure uh, trends across the globe. Um, and the, the, the message to get from this uh, in aggregate is you'll notice a lot of downward sloping lines from left to right, uh, meaning licensure levels across uh, most of the industrialized wor world um, have been declining for young folks. Um, uh, over the past uh, several years, uh, a fair amount of that's attributable to urbanization and some other things, um, uh, but it's not unique to the U.S. and, it, and it's, it's certainly borne out in uh, in the data. Uh, there's been a lot of speculation as to cause and effect as well. Um, here's some Florida data on both registered vehicles and licensed. Uh, drivers, and you can see some interesting fluctuations there between uh, situations where we've got more or less vehicles than drivers um, in the data, which is always kind of an interesting uh, reference point or touch point for, for analysts. Um, the AAA has recently done some uh, survey work looking at young folks and trying to understand uh, what's going on in terms of licensure levels. Um, uh, and you can see the numbers there, 44% licensed within a year of the minimum age, 54% uh, before turning uh, 18. Uh, they found that household income was a very strong factor. Uh, race, racial and ethnic differences still persist, uh, even when you control for income. Um, a lot of reasons, uh, not having a car, costs associated with driving, uh, alternatives, ways to get around that are available, et cetera. Um, they didn't find any evidence that the graduated driver's license was particularly significant. Um, or that social media necessarily uh, was a substitute um, in their work. Um, the uh, when you look at the millennial group, there's a number of, of kind of interesting observations. It's gotten a great deal of attention. Um, they do have very high unemployment levels, uh, unprecedented historically. Uh, a lot of school loan debt that can impact. Uh, you know, ability to establish households, buy vehicles, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, tough uh, first entry into the job market, uh, lots of compensation, not the same upward mobility that might have existed in, uh, in some prior generations, et cetera. Um, uh, some of those uh, retirement age folks aren't retiring quite as fast, uh, uh, and so there's certainly not the growth in opportunities that uh, some other generations have experienced. Um, <clears throat> And, you know, obviously fuel costs, et cetera, on top of that, um, you know, re result in a very strong kind of economic argument. And, um, you know, the speculation has been, is it, you know, is it economics and how much does economics explain relative to culture and other factors? And um, it's important to understand that the economic are, are very, very significant and powerful uh, and very different than historic uh, conditions. Uh, in addition, the generation is different than prior generations. Uh, the median age of marriage has increased about five years since 1970, um, and with that, of course, comes household formation and, and a number of other uh, aspects that, that are very much related to travel demand. Uh, Delays of starting family, uh, fairly significant, about four years, 3.6 years. Um, the delays in, in home ownership, uh, uh, one source indicated uh, uh, first-time home buyers have shifted from 23 in the 60s to 35 now, um, obviously significant in terms of uh, uh, propensity to travel. Um, <coughs> 
An- another one that, that uh, I think bear, bears a, a great deal more research is, is really the composition of the, uh, the young adult population uh, relative to some historic norms. And uh, this just gives a hint of how different things are. In 1964% of children were born to foreign-born mothers. In 2010, that number was 29 or 21%. Um, so a real different social demographic group of folks are entering the workforce uh, and are making up that millennial generation um, that may have a different uh, distribution and set of characteristics than, uh, say, when the baby boom generation was uh, was at that age in, in their uh, lifestyle. Um, and I would speculate here, obviously, they're more urban, and, and data can be pulled to support that uh, in terms of the share of the, the young population that's urban uh, in resident. Um, but we've also got uh, a significant, or at least hypothesized, a significant share come from lower income households uh, that are less able to provide the financial support for education and car ownership and insurance, et cetera. Um, it wasn't uncommon for uh, baby boom generation folks to have, you know, help from the parents with the first car and the house down payment and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and it's quite possible that this next generation doesn't have parents in the same financial situation uh, to provide that same kind of support uh, that can be a factor. Um, there's also discussion of whether or not value differences are part of that, um, and uh, uh, obviously we hear a lot about this whole issue of substituting communication uh, in lieu of travel. Um, it's real, it's substantive, it's quantifiable. Um, you know, the magnitude of it isn't, isn't completely sorted out and certainly not the trend going forward, um, but it's certainly, as we speak on a webinar, it's certainly real. Um, and, you know, we see it in education, uh, retail, et cetera. Um, there, there does appear to be a different attitude toward vehicle ownership. Uh, it's not the same path to freedom and independence. Um, and I, I, you know, I've been thinking about this some in the context of, of differences over time, uh, from kind of popular culture images in, in, in media uh, to other things. And um, you need to realize that in, in kind of the baby boom generation, oftentimes a, a young adult was escaping a household with three or four siblings that was a, you know, 1,500 square foot household on average, and they were frankly eager to leave. Um, and today you're more likely to have a, a single sibling and a much larger your house with amenities and um, and and living under the parents' uh, uh, house and and, uh, and and budget uh, are something that a lot more young people are much more willing to do. And the parents are off at work, so you've got a lot of freedom and discretion. And uh, it's a, it's a little different world uh, uh, in a lot of ways. And uh, and that car isn't isn't seen quite the same as it used to be. Um, whether or not that you know sustained over time remains to be seen. But uh, so Certainly for the present, there's a different uh, uh, level of exception. Um, cars don't seem to be the enabler of socialization. Uh, we do have other alternatives like texting and, and uh, Twitter and, and, and cell phones, obviously. Um, and, and there's at least some speculation that the generation applies um, you know, different environmental sensitivity. I have not seen any evidence. Um, uh, it may certainly may exist. It's not my area of research, um, uh, but but we don't know for sure. Um, this issue of income and uh, mobility uh, or wealth and mobility is one that's kind of intrigued me, um, and I kind of uh, satired a little bit here by looking at a, a couple uh, that that won a lotto, a big lotto, a number of years ago, and um, you know the the first thing the guy says is I'm going to sell my big truck up big pickup truck and go for a walk, and uh, the next guy says, I'm not going to Disney. I'm going to stay home and watch the Disney Channel on the big screen, and uh, the woman's going to sell her suburban house and uh, and quit hosting family holiday get-togethers and buy a downtown condo, and, you know, you, the, the reaction is not, um, because the American – do aspire for mobility, and almost every time you think of uh, or hear somebody talking about, you know, jobs, promotion, winning money, uh, et cetera, et cetera, um, travel, vehicles, uh, et cetera, are part of that equation. Um, that doesn't appear to have waned. 
Um, uh, if there's more wealth, people will travel more. I don't think that uh, uh, that relationship's been broken uh, at all. Uh, it might be different, but it's it's not broken, and I think we need to keep that in mind. Um, we have looked at some of the data uh, in terms of uh, uh, income and travel. Um, this is just a trend on median household income uh, by quintile from 67 to 2008, um, and this this basically says the stuff that that you know the media has been talking about. Um, uh, the rich get richer, and everybody else is struggling, um, and and that's certainly. Uh, borne out in this data, uh, the highest quintile uh, has continued to see some uh, rel relatively strong upward income growth uh, throughout that time period, uh, with the other 80% uh, of the population really not seeing, certainly 60%, uh, not seeing that growth. Um, and then when you look at travel uh, by these same quintiles, uh, you'll see one line that's the continued upward slope line, and that's that fifth high income quintile, uh, meaning if you look at the trend from 83 to 2009, um, it's that top quintile that continued to show more person miles of travel um, over those time periods. Every other group um, had a regression of the amount of travel uh, since 1995 um, based on uh, income levels. Some, you know, hit slightly more severely than others, and uh, one can speculate on, you know, just shares of discretionary travel and, uh, and relative significance of cost of travel, et cetera, uh, to those various uh, income quartiles or quintiles. Um, Historically, I'd kind of speculated that the, that the wealthiest share of the population might have travel time budget constraints um, and, and wouldn't see additional travel. Um, I've kind of modified that in light of this data. Um, and it's what I think might be the case is, is perhaps their local and um, uh, person serving, household serving travel uh, become satiated at higher income levels. Um, they're not making more trips to the store or work or the restaurant. Um, but their getaway weekends, uh, trip to that second or third home, uh, uh, you know, visit to the uh, alumni reunion or uh, favorite team's football game, et cetera, uh, hop on a plane to the Caribbean or the ski slopes. Um, those kinds of things um, would continue to, aspirations for those would probably continue uh, in spite of uh, other constraints uh, if the wealth are available. So there does seem to be uh, growing travel demand uh, in those groups. And, and, and when you reflect on the future of, of VMT, um, this begs the issue of to understand the future of travel. I need to understand where the money's going, um, where there's going to be growth in income across those income distribution areas. Um, uh, I'm going to turn here to some of our constraints, uh, what we do and don't know. Um, and, and I think there's a number of things. This first set here is on theory. Um, we've got a weak understanding of the linkages between the components of GDP uh, and person and freight travel. And remember, GDP will be linked differently to both person and freight travel. Uh, and there are several different components of GDP, personal expenditures, government, uh, private sector investment, et cetera. Um, and they each may have a different relationship to, to, uh, to travel demand. Um, We've got a relatively limited insight on how wealth and discretionary income uh, versus total income affects travel. Uh, historically, uh, income drove vehicle availability. Um, we've kind of saturated vehicle availability, so understanding income travel relationships, and not just income but wealth, uh, are, are, we're, we're really not nearly as strong in those areas as, as I wish we were. Um, we don't know too much about the satiation effect travel time, budgets, et cetera. Uh, there's been some work in those areas, but as we think about the future uh, travel demand, there's certainly room for more uh, more work on those areas. Um, the, there's 
at least some evidence that, that social relationships are obviously a big generator of travel. Um, I would argue that historically social relationships have been home-based. Um, over the past uh, half a century or more, they've moved to workplace-based. Uh, and now they seem to be moving to web and or communication-based. Uh, not that there's not elements of that in both the home and workplace, um, but we've, we've that social interaction, the focus of that shifts uh, as technology and culture changes, um, and that is a generator or a, or a factor in understanding travel demand uh, in area where I think we can learn more. Um, uh, the communication substitution factor, there's been some early research on that um, that, that uh, very effectively itemized some pros and cons, um, and, uh, but I think we've reached some critical mass and market penetration issues that beg some revisiting of that research. I think all of those areas are taking off, um, and uh, we're starting to see a net uh, uh, significant benefit of substitution uh, of communication for travel. Um, we don't know a lot about how different uh, cultural things, sensitivity to personal health, safety, uh, environment, et cetera, uh, influence travel behavior. There's starting to be some work on, uh, on pieces of that, um, but we don't know, independent of economic and demographic uh, characteristics, how much these really influence travel. Um, and, and household, the composition of households are changing more. Um, there's, I would argue, more independent economic and decision-making units within the same household. Um, so household behaviors might not be uh, as as strong as they were, uh, or they may be, let's put it this way, different than they were in the past when we had more traditional households. Um, when you look at the data side of things, um, uh, the National Travel Survey data is limited in frequency, um, and that's a constraint, and it's particularly a constraint when we're going through areas where um, travel behavior appears to be changing rapidly. Uh, so those of us that are interested in this are anxious for, for new data uh, to see if, if some of our theories and hypotheses can be borne out with that data. Um, we, we have some uh, holes in our non-personal travel, the public vehicle travel and utility service travel. Our knowledge of those isn't particularly strong and how those respond to economy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, the freight travel, um, we know the trends. There's certainly been more work on it. I'm not an expert in freight travel. But I haven't seen a kind of a clear mapping of, you know, how much is volume changes versus trip length versus improved logistics, uh, mode shifts between freight modes, et cetera. Um, uh, we haven't really uh, diagnosed the full change in, in particularly heavy vehicle travel uh, over the last decade and, and as well. Um, I'd be interested to know if folks have used some of the local surveys and or the count data um, and, and kind of pasted that against historical trends to see, for example, our, our, our trip generation survey or study data, count data, um, you know, matching uh, the trends of, of personal household survey data in terms of uh, trip rates and trip purpose distributions, et cetera. Um, we're not perhaps using uh, local data to try and synthesize a broader uh, national understanding as much as we might. Um, and, and there's obviously a, a, a shortage of information on long distance, uh, non-routine person travel. There was some, you know, high interest in, in doing a better job of that uh, a few years ago when we were talking uh, a lot more about high-speed rail. Um, I still think there's a strong uh, need to understand that because that has a differential sensitivity to, uh, to some of the conditions that are influencing future travel. Um, <clears throat> On the demographic side, there's some conflicting and contradictory data on locational trends of millennials and seniors. And um, we, we seem to have reached a point where if the media says something three times, it's taken as fact, uh, whether or not there's underlying data to support it. Um, we've seen an awful lot of discussion of, of 
uh, location preferences and trends without the data to back it up, um, and, and that concerns me as an analyst. Um, we've seen some contradictory trends on growth trends, urban, suburban, and non-urban areas, um, and, and some of those haven't been fully diagnosed. We do know that there's, um, for example, uh, strong natural growth in some urban cores because they are populated with, with folks that have higher fertility levels, et cetera, uh, versus move-in. Um, um, and, and, de and understanding both the jurisdictional issues and the natural growth versus migration issues uh, and some of those trends, the reference time points is important, uh, and there's certainly work to be done there. Uh, household composition changes as well. Um, finally, some of the media um, it confuses some traveler stated preference uh, uh, data with revealed preference data, uh, i.e. what people say they want to do or are doing uh, doesn't match what they're actually being measured as doing uh, or have historically uh, done post-survey, um, and, and we confuse or sometimes put a lot more credence in revealed or stated preference data than perhaps we should, um, and oftentimes we've got what I'm characterizing here as author preference based on anecdotal data, um, where somebody will observe something in uh, a particular community, um, et cetera, and then extrapolate that to a national trend. Um, and, and I would argue that particularly even if you look at the millennial generation, there's a very diverse young population. It's important to remember, for example, you know, half of the students in New York don't graduate high school. Uh, depending on which measure you use, probably a third of the students in Texas and Florida don't graduate high school. Um, and those folks aren't, you know, living in creative uh, class jobs in condos downtown. Um, it's, it's people need to recognize the diversity of the population. Uh, and when they, when they look at these trends, they need to, uh, you know, capture and understand the significance of every market subsegment uh, in the national totals as well. Um, the economy is clearly critical to travel. We know that. Um, and, and in a lot of ways, uh, uh, I get frustrated with the amount of energy we spend trying to forecast travel when the single fundamental, perhaps most important input uh, is, is economic growth, and we don't have a very good handle on that. Um, We've got limited number of sources and, and high degree of uncertainty. Um, and as I hinted in the in the quintile, income quintile issues, we need to not only understand it, but we need to understand how it's distributed uh, across sectors of the economy and across the population. Um, we're seeing changes in employment here, uh, part-time, full-time uh, changes, uh, on-site versus telecommute, uh, changes, rapid changes in labor force participation, uh, and it'll be important to understand those going forward as well. Uh, if we look at things. Um, historically, we've seen, you know, a lot of these trends that have been talked about, labor force participation, vehicle ownership, migration to suburbs, et cetera, uh, the shifts to personal vehicle. We, we, we understand those trends fairly well. Uh, it's a little bit premature, in my opinion, to discern uh, the magnitude and the, and the kind of the staying power of some of these new trends. Uh, more data will help, um, and in, in some of them we don't know if these are permanent lifelong changes or if these are uh, simply, for example, in the millennial generation, uh, simply a reflection of the fact that um, the maturation to adult hold time frame uh, is being stretched out several more years uh, uh, longer than it was a, a half a century ago. And um, when folks uh, reach 30, they might start to adapt historic behaviors of, of, of adults uh, at that age that, that previously existed, um, or at least uh, much more uh, significantly adapt those behaviors, um, but we don't know uh, that versus whether or not those will be sustained uh, longer uh, into their lives. Um, a couple of reflections on, on some things that uh, are implications of this. Um, uh, travel options to the auto will fare better if high fixed, low variable cost auto ownership changes. And uh, by that I mean um, right now, once that auto ownership decision is made, uh, the marginal cost of using a car is really relatively modest um, if that paradigm shifts uh, to 
something else, I think we have a much stronger uh, chance of, of, in effect, leveling the playing field in terms of the discrete uh, travel decision. Um, uh, we've got another trend taking place here. Uh, I'd say to influence travel behavior, transportation revenues should be user-based with transparency. I, I think the, the most significant way to influence travel behavior is the, you know, the taxi cab meter clicking away the cost and a fully amortized cost in real time. Uh, and yet our transportation financing mechanisms are moving away from that. Um, so the kind of the feedback mechanisms uh, are moving away. And if you fund transportation with either general funds or, you know, land use value capture, et cetera, uh, you, you lose any feedback to behavior uh, in, in doing that. And uh, that create some challenges to the extent that we want to influence travel behavior. Um, this whole issue of whether or not we're going to continue to realize economies of scale by consolidation of functions, uh, we did it on, you know, the retail side with big box stores, uh, but we're doing it in healthcare and government and education uh, and all kinds of things. And even in the recent uh, recession, it wasn't uncommon across the country for libraries to be cut back and parks to be cut back, et cetera, because it's simply easier to staff uh, a single park instead of two parks, and uh, we continue to do that with a consequence of needing to travel more. Um, we don't know what's going to happen with autonomous or connected smart vehicles. Um, we don't know how that will increase capacity to the extent that it, it means closer following and, and better throughput, uh, or we don't know how much uh, deadhead demand or latent travel demand uh, might be created as, as a result of uh, autonomous uh, vehicles. Um, I would caution on unintended consequences of desired changes. Uh, we're looking at enough variables here that uh, sometimes our presumed consequence aren't realized. Uh, a classic one is the shift to transit and saving energy. Um, if you shift to transit in the right environments, in the right markets, it's energy efficient. Uh, if you don't have those right markets, uh, it's not energy efficient. It's less efficient, and uh, that may be even more so the case in the future with new technologies. Um, uh, similarly, the whole issue of auto ownership, uh, we've got some emerging technologies on the auto side, hybrids, alternative fuel, et cetera, um, and if ownership declines, um, if you've got a, a three-household or a three-vehicle household, uh, it's it's easy to rationalize one of them perhaps being a, a, a special purpose uh, a vehicle like a hybrid or full electric. Uh, if you don't um, have three vehicles, then you might not be willing to do that. So it could impact our, our willingness to explore things. Um, and, and just for fun, as we wrap up here and move on to some questions, uh, I've, uh, over the years I've identified a number of other strategies that I'm sure activist planners are, are going to be quick to implement here. Uh, reorganize sport conferences to minimize travel. Don't give out tickets to visiting teams. Uh, require divorcing couples with kids to do an environmental impact statement on the visitation shared custody transportation plan. Uh, restrict annual leave to two-week blocks to avoid energy-intensive weekend getaways. Uh, make house swapping practical and cheap uh, so that folks can actually optimize household travel. Uh, right now, the transaction cost of moving is so large that uh, virtually nobody's uh, uh, economically practical to, to move to save money. Uh, outlaw youth sports travel teams, ban trips to doggy daycare, ban any trips to serve pets with a doodle in the name. Uh, standardized restaurant menus so no one is motivated to travel across town to a different restaurant uh, and price airline tickets by the pound mile. And um, and finally, as you prepare for the future, um, this one seems to be, there we go. Sometimes things don't go as planned. Um, and we've certainly seen some unanticipated things in travel behavior. A lot of what we're looking at lately aren't things that folks were talking about uh, 20 and 30 years ago, um, and we need to, you know, continue to think forward that there might be some other changes in the future. Uh, with that, I'd be glad to take questions. This took a little longer than than, than I thought. I love the subject and, uh, and 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 talk too much about it, but uh, 
this uh, presentation will be taped and available for folks, um, and Phil will moderate any questions that you might have. Um, if not, uh, now don't hesitate to drop me a note uh, by email. I'd be more than happy to uh, uh, to talk about the subject with anyone that's interested. I know there's some um, some good folks on the phone here that I've collaborated with, uh, or on the line here that I've collaborated with, and 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 bounce some of these issues and ideas off of. And uh, appreciate your participation today. Thank you, Steve. Uh, yeah, we certainly have time for questions, so here's how you can ask them. Uh, we've already had several that have already come in during your presentation. The first one, Steve, is your graphs show that PMT by all modes peaks several years earlier than VMT. Was that on a per capita basis or absolute numbers? Is there anything you infer from this as to why PMT by all modes should have peaked before VMT? Um, yeah, we, we've looked at that, um, and is, is what was happening is the dominance of vehicle travel continued, um, i.e., shifts away from bike walk and transit uh, continued a little bit longer um, than you know. Once once total travel had plateaued, there was still a shift of vehicle travel for a number of years beyond those points. And then uh, probably the mid-2005-ish range, I know on the transit side, um, uh, you know, in the transit side it was about 1995 where we started to see kind of a bottoming out of mode trend. Um, we've got less good data on, you know, bike and walk and, and, and those kinds of things and shared ride. But, you know, those kind of bottomed out, which were kind of peak total VMT, Years and 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 as those have in effect recovered a little bit, we've started to see the uh, the reductions in VMT as well. Okay. The second question is, uh, do you have any insight on what impact telework and mobility has had on, uh, I guess, the mobile workforce has that had on vehicle miles of travel? You, you know, we we haven't specifically crunched the numbers. We could. We know how much travel is for commuting. Uh, we know what share of the population is teleworking. Um, we haven't looked at the at the marginals. Um, you know, recognize that about 28 percent of person travel is for work purposes, um, and and you know. The, uh, Work at home is about four percent now, um, and so you know you could you could come up with some crude national you know guesstimates. Um, it, it in terms of a big mover, it's been moving. I mean, in, in, when you look at, uh, at at data changes over time, the big movers are the you know the work at home uh, and and the decline in carpooling in terms of commuting. Um, those are kind of the fast trends um, that we're seeing. Okay. Um, has your research indicated why there is a continued decline in carpooling? No, it hasn't. And Phil, you you probably know as well as I do that there's a a host of issues there. We certainly speculated on uh, on some things. Obviously, the quality of transit's improved in some places, and 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 some of those carpoolers might have shifted to transit. Um, you know, vehicle ownership levels still are high. Um, and I think there's some other things. Perhaps, for example, um, the prevalence of of cell phones and the ability to to you know, communicate and do things uh, in a personal vehicle on the phone uh, that you wouldn't do in a group vehicle if you're traveling. Um, you now have some opportunity to use that commute time productively, even as an SOV, um, and you know that might have put some pressure. Uh, I know you've speculated that uh, we have looked specifically at some declines in uh, in job types that are conducive to uh, to carpooling, construction workers and agriculture. Cultural workers uh, tend to have high propensity to carpool, and construction obviously got uh, hurt significantly uh, with the economy. So I think there's probably a, a host of factors uh, that have come into play, but certainly convenience is one of those, and, and people value convenience. There's no question about it. Okay. Thanks, Steve. Uh, we'll take a few more questions, but if you have to leave, before you leave, if you take a few minutes to go ahead and complete uh, this very brief evaluation, that would be Helpful to us. A um, couple. More, we'll take uh, three more questions, Steve. Um, okay. As, as your, uh, do you have any idea how shopping by the internet is affecting travel behavior? 
Um, yeah, I do. It was interesting. Just uh, just yesterday, there was some speculation on uh, on national media. They were saying right now, seven percent of retail activity, and I believe that's measured in dollars, um, is uh, internet based, web based. Um, each you know holiday season, it's ratcheted up a double 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 digit percent increase. Um, so it's it's starting to become significant. Uh, some of the early work speculated on whether or not um, communication and technology was a net factor, um, i.e. you might, you know, go online, find something you're interested in and drive further to get to it um, than you would have otherwise, or you might uh, Still go look at it in the store, but order it online, and 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 so there, you know, there's some folks that have looked uh, in in more depth at the kind of the net effect. I think we've reached critical mass in the technologies and things like PayPal and uh, quick shipping and return policies and a number of other things that um, I think it's going to be a meaningful factor in terms of reducing uh, shopping travel going forward. All right. Um Quick, are there any data out there specific to VMT and travel trends for universities? Um, no, not that I've not that I've seen. I mean, there is data on you know university bus uh, uh, system ridership and some things like that. Um, I've not seen anything. I don't know if the you know, distance learning is certainly uh, growing rapidly, um, and that can be playing a factor. Um, the full-time, part-time student issue uh, uh, could be playing a factor, but I've not really seen that quantified. All right, and last question. Any other questions that come in, I'll, I'll make sure Steve gets them and he'll um, respond uh, to you. Um, are there energy improvements in transit vehicles that can balance the energy efficiency gains in automobiles? Are efficient autos really penetrating the market in a way that makes the possible energy efficiency gains real? Um, actually, if, if folks look at our, our Nectar website, we did do a study specifically looking at that a few years ago, and that report would be on the Nectar website. Um, basically, it requires a variety of assumptions of both technology deployment and customer acceptance on, on the personal vehicle side. Um, I think the best thinking suggests that we're going to continue to see um, technology improvements in both modes travel, um, and and so I don't think we're likely to um, to see huge changes there, uh, particularly on the bus side. On the rail side, it tends to be more efficient in general, but it also tends to have a longer replacement cycle, and uh, integrating new technology is 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 vastly more expensive and harder to do. Um, the, the thing, the challenge on the transit side will be keeping the productivity up. And uh, as we're eager to expand services, we've historically added more service at a faster rate than ridership's increased, uh, and that's dampened the energy efficiency of the mode. Um, so we need to keep the demand growing at least as fast as the supply uh, to keep the competitive balance situation uh, it, the same as it is today. Okay. Well, um, again, on behalf of the Center for Urban Transportation Research at the University of South Florida, we thank all of you for joining us today for our biweekly Cutter webcast. Um, hope to see you in two weeks. Check our website, and we'll get some further announcements out of our upcoming webinars. And with that, thank you, Steve, and have a great afternoon, everybody. Bye-bye.